Hey friends, how are you doing today? I hope you're feeling blessed and staying in God's presence. And if not, I hope you feel uplifted after today's video. If you're new here, welcome to His Princess Christian Community, where we read a chapter of the Bible every day and then discuss it afterwards and in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow and it opens the door for more people to join our community. And while you're at it, check the description box. We got a lot of great stuff in there. So today we're reading Matthew chapter 18, but before we get started, I wanted to say a prayer if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads with me. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together here on His Princess Christian Community. Thank you for opening the door for people to join our community, for connecting us and strengthening our bond. Thank you for opening our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to your word. Thank you for your wisdom, understanding, and clarity as we seek to interpret your word. And thank you for the courage to apply it to our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 18. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin? Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with one, only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. But if your eyes cause you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others on the hill and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the ninety-nine that didn't wander away. In the same way, it's not, it is not my Heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but seventy, seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the, pro in the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned, to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me. I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him only a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay for it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were upset. They were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. 
Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Amen. So what did you think of Matthew chapter 18? I'm interested to hear about it in the comments below. Let me know what your insights or interpretations were on the chapter. Maybe comment your favorite verse or just say hi and let us know that you're part of the community. And if you need prayer, make sure you're putting that in the comments too so we can pray together as a community. And if you've been blessed, let us know so that we can rejoice with you. Um, so Matthew 18 starts off with the greatest in the kingdom and the disciples are coming to him and they're asking him who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and um, Jesus responds by telling him um, that you have to turn from your sins and become like little children um, and I love this idea because when you think back to your childhood about your imagination about your dependence um, on your fa your parents you know your father and your mother to take care of you to provide all your needs um, these are things that we need to have for God so we need to look to God to provide every morsel of food we have the roof over our head um, everything that we have and we need to have faith that they will provide that for us and we also need to um, you know have that imagination and that belief in things you know when we're little we believe in fairy tales and stories um, but we have a real life hero um, among us and that's Jesus he lives inside us he lives with us you know through the Holy Spirit and we need to really have faith that the spirit can move like we read in all those children's books um, and you know it's like magic and, you know it's it's really like magic the way God just works and I think that we need to learn to believe in that again um, as adults and we also need to be humble and uh, you know I underlined humble in this situation because children are humble because they require so much they require so much attention and they're always bugging you <laughs> they're always like hey mom hey mom hey mom hey mom you know they're always asking questions they're always you know wanting you to play with them and be with them and um, you know they're always just coming to you for all their needs so I think that that's something that we need to do with God um, and it says the next part talks about um, you know leading people into temptation and into sin um, so you know we really need to keep um, we should not do anything that causes another believer to stumble or to um, lead them into temptation. And, you know, a lot of people will try to test your faith or test your religion. Like, how religious is she really? Will she do this? And will she, will she do that? And that is not a true believer. A true believer would never, um, you know, if they know that you maybe have a drug problem, would not drop drugs in front of your face and tempt you to take them you know another if uh, um, another believer knows that you're really sensitive then they wouldn't pull pranks on you because that's not what um, loving someone is is like and I think that that's where a lot of people you know lose lose um, you know where their where their focus is their focus is supposed to be on God not on you um, so you should definitely trust God to lead you and guide you and if you are around people who are tempting you to sin then those people are not for you um, you definitely you know especially if you are feeling that temptation um, stand your ground you know hold on to your faith in God pray for those people and you know separate yourself we should definitely separate ourselves from sin and temptation now you know it de it definitely says that Jesus came for the sinner so maybe um, you know I think that Christians sometimes get that confused um, we need to learn to affect other sinners instead of being infected by them and I think that that's a very fine line especially with people who are new to their faith so I would just say tread carefully and ask for discernment in those matters but it definitely says that um, um, if one foot causes you to sin cut it off and throw it away so you know it's not necessarily cutting your foot off but cutting off what causes you to sin and if that happens to be people you have to trust in that discernment to cut those people out of your life if there's certain places like for instance the club you know there's a lot of young people who go to the club and there's a lot of smoking and there's drinking and there's you know sexual immorality and um, so you know you really have to if, if that's drawing you into the sin if you can't just go there and uphold 
hold your faith and not sin, then we don't need to go to those types of places. We need to cut those things out of our lives. If you're a shopping addict, you know, then you shouldn't be going to the mall every weekend or, you know, you shouldn't be scrolling on Amazon all the time. You know, these are things that we need to really be aware of. If you binge watch TV, maybe you need to put a lock on your TV. If you are, you know, binge binging social media, you know, do like they do parental controls. Can you can isolate times where you're only allowed to, you know, have access to the internet during these times. You know, these are things that we as believers have to do in order to get control over our sin. Um, God has given us that authority and that power. And if we seek him in that, he will give us the means and the ways. So there's always a way. Um, you know, just, you know, take control of your life and remove the sin from your life. Um, the next section is the parable of the lost sheep. And, you know, I wrote to side, thank you for finding me, God, because I definitely felt like I was lost for a while. And he definitely came and yanked me back into the flock. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, and, you know, I'm interested to see, you know, I, I love a lot of these parables and I love how they were, you know, of the times back then. Um, but I'm interested, you know, to see like these types of parables in modern day, you know, um, explanations, you know, you don't have a lot of shepherds nowadays, um, but you definitely have other types of, you know, people, you know, in, you know, would a CEO really um, leave all the people in his company to help one person who may not be performing their job appropriately? Um, you know, so these are types of things that, you know, I would, I, I would love to, get a better idea of. These are the types of things that you don't see as much in modern day life. And I think that's kind of a shame. But I think the most important thing is that um, if you see somebody wandering away that you know is a believer, then you need to stop what you're doing and sacrifice in order to keep that person from sinning. So if you have to sacrifice of your time, of your money, you know, maybe that person is just drowning where they are, um, then you need to help pull them out of that water, just as Jesus would pull you out of the water if you started to drown. Um, so, you know, help those who are wandering. <laughs> the next is correcting another believer. And I think the, the key point is the, is the first thing it says, go privately. Um, to that person and point it out. So don't make a spectacle of it at first, you know, give them a chance to repent and turn from their ways. And then again, go with, you know, groups of other believers and say, hey, you know, because if you can't get one or two other people to go with you, then maybe it's all in your head. You know, you have to kind of, you know, um, keep that in, in, in the forefront of your mind is to say like, if you, if there's not other people who are willing to agree with you on this, then maybe it's you that needs to rethink whether you're being easily offended or whether this is something that really needs correction. Um, and again, there's that verse 18, which says, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Um, so I'm still a little, you know, I don't really understand that verse very much. Um, so I'd love your insights in the comments below on that. Um, if you didn't comment on the last video. And then um, verse 19 says, um, if you, two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask my father in heaven, we'll do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. And I love this, just praying in agreement and prayers in agreement work so fast and so well. Um, you know, especially when you're praying with people who have similar faith as you, you know, um, people who are on the same path, agreeing um, for anything you know, within God's, you know, with, within what pleases God, you know, you, it will be granted for you. So I think it's important that we pray together as a community. Um, so again, if you, there's something that you need prayer for, make sure you're putting that in the comments below so that we can pray together as a community. And if you don't have somebody that you can reach out to with your prayers, you know, join a small group at your church, um, you know, find somebody that you can call on and prayer. There's tons of prayer lines out there. Um, you know, I'll try to look some up and put some in the description box um, where you can go out there and, and put your prayers out there so that you have other people praying in agreement with you. And if, if this is something that you don't feel comfortable sharing with other people, then that's something that you really need to talk to God about, about either removing the shame from being able to ask for help, or maybe is it something that you shouldn't be asking for? 
Um, so, you know, those are things that you need to um, seek God in. Um, the next section is the parable of the unforgiving debtor. And I love this. It says, um, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times. And Jesus said, um, 70 times seven. And I just love this. Um, you know, just being able to easily forgive is, is something that, um, I feel like I'm good at because I always forgive people, but um, learning to keep people at a distance is something that you have to learn to do in order to survive loving people from a distance. Um, you can definitely love people from a distance. Um, you know, if, so, if you you know, share some of your life with somebody and then they run and gossip and tell everybody you can forgive them, but you don't have to, that doesn't mean you have to continue to share your life with them. You know, sometimes things happen so that you can create boundaries in your life. And God is a God of boundaries. We've seen that so much in the old Testament, just God creating boundaries. And I think that that's what we need to do. And I think that's where a lot of people get confused about loving others and forgiveness is the difference between, um, loving someone, forgiving them, and then having boundaries in your life, you know, trusting God to protect you. Sometimes he's protecting you by asking you to create boundaries in your life to say, only go as far as here and only go as far as here. You know, um, God did it in the garden. He said, don't eat from this tree. He created a boundary right there. Um, and they, you know, abused that rule. And I think that it's important for us to listen to those boundaries that God is setting up in our lives. Like, you know, this, you know, these are the only the people that you should be around, but that doesn't mean that you can't treat other people kindly and with love and, um, you know, with comfort. And if they come to you, um, offer to help them if in any way that you can. Um, so I definitely think that it's important for us to learn to forgive people. And part of forgiving somebody is the way you feel about it. So you can say you forgive them all that you want, but how do you really feel about it? When you think about them, do you think about, are you thinking about what they've done to you? Um, that's kind of the key to knowing that you haven't truly forgiven them. If you're constantly replaying what they've done to you in the past over again in your head, um, if you're constantly bringing it to the forefront of your mind, whenever you think of them, um, that means that that's like kind of a good check in to say that you maybe you haven't forgiven them all the way. Um, you know, partial forgiveness when you can still be kind to them and still be nice to them and still love them according to God's word. Um, but then, you know, that deep forgiveness to really say that you've you don't remember their sins anymore. Um, that's the kind of the kind of forgiveness that God has, where He doesn't He no longer remembers your sins. Um, so that's what we're striving for, and I think that's what I need to work on the most is you know just. Um, not remembering other people's sin the way they've sinned against me is not is is where i'm struggling the most um because once they it's, it's like as soon as it's like i'm pr i'm protecting myself from them doing it to me again and then you know when they do it again then it's like up oh, see i told you <laughs> i told you god so you know it's it's definitely a work in progress and something that you have to to do for um to do in order to be forgiven is to forgive others. That's what we want from God. We don't want him to remember our sins. So we need not to remember other people's sins. And I think again, part of that comes with setting up boundaries so that you don't allow people to hurt you the same way that they hurt you before. Um, and then I love this at the end where it's talking about the debtor and this again, the same situation. God gave us mercy. He had mercy on us. So that's the same mercy that we should um, provide for other people. Um, it says I highlighted it says you evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on the fellow servant just as I've had mercy on you? And most certainly I think that is the hardest part about forgiveness when someone doesn't apologize or plead with you for forgiveness the way that we plead with God for forgiveness. Um, I think that's the hardest part is forgiving somebody when they haven't admitted they've done anything wrong. And I think that's where um, I struggle the most with forgiveness. If somebody, you know, comes to me and they say they're sorry, then it's easy to forgive them of their sins and to let that go. But when somebody hasn't admitted to their fault and then they just keep doing the same thing over and over again, then you know, it's like, how do you forgive them? How do you let that go? Um, you know, it's just sometimes I, I'm just like so 
in awe of God and how he's able to deal with us as humans. I mean, geez, we're just so difficult. <laughs> we're so difficult. Um, and then um, verse 35 says, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you for refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart and I think that's the most important part from your heart and people are so easy it's so easy to put on a mask and you know like they say kill people with kindness but what does your heart really say and I think you know that's where a lot of Christians fall short because they can act like a Christian but do they really feel like a Christian are they really a Christian at heart you know are you really is your heart your mind and the things that you say all in harmony that's when you truly know that um, you are um, you know close getting closer to God when you're pleasing to God when the things that you think the things that you say and the things that you feel are all in harmony and that's what we're definitely striving for that's the race that we're in and we're gonna keep pressing on and you know it's it's something that you have to work on every day you have to capture those thoughts you have to recognize those feelings you have to watch the things that you say and you know every day it'll get easier we just have to keep striving for that and through God's grace and mercy it is definitely possible so that is my interpretation of Matthew chapter 18. Sorry for all the rambling, but um, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about it. Leave it in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I hope you stay blessed, stay in God's presence, and have a great rest of your day. I love you.